We're back now to Tucker's Tucket's Gold by Gary Paulson. We're going to read ta chapter two. I found out that a young man is watching and reading along with me. It's Eli. Hello, Eli. Thanks for reading along with me. Here we go. Chapter two. They reached the trees just as the edge of the cloud caught up with them. Ten more feet and I would have died, Lottie whispered and sank to the ground. Francis dropped Billy like a stone. The boy fell without awakening and and they studied their location. It was a meandering, dry stream bed with a row of stunted but leafy cottonwoods along each side. There were also stands of salt cedar, thick and green, and while no water was evident, the stream bed seemed moist. Francis knew there was water beneath the surface of the trees, uh, or the trees would have been, uh, been dead. Lottie, scoop a hole there at the base of that rock. You might... You want to start digging? Why don't you just go ahead? I have more important things to do than scrape up the, at the old ground. Water, Francis was so dry he croaked. Dig down and let it seep in. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Lottie knelt by the rock and started digging in the loose sand with her hands. When she was down two feet, she yelped. Here it is, just like you said, coming in from the sides. Oh, Francis, it's so clear. Come see. She scooped up some up and drank it. Sweet as sugar, come, try it. Francis knelt and cupped his hand and drank and thought he had never tasted anything so good. But he stopped before he was full. The wind was picking up now, blowing hard enough to lift dust and even sand, and he could no longer see the dust from the riders. The wind was blowing at the coming, at the coming thunderheads, and he smiled because even if it didn't rain, there was a good chance the rain, the wind would fill in and destroy their tracks. But now the thunderhead was over them, dark, so huge it covered a whole sky, and the wind had increased to a scream. Over here, Francis yelled to Lottie, beneath this ledge. Incredibly, Billy was still asleep. <laughs> Francis grabbed the boy and shook him until his eyes opened. Get over by the rock ledge. Everything is going to break loose. A bolt of lightning hit so close, Francis felt his hair, that it rippled his hair. So close, the thunder seemed to happen in the same split instant and with it the sky opened and water fell on them so hard it almost drove francis to his knees he had never seen such rain there seemed to be no space between the drops it roared down poured down in sheets and in buckets francis couldn't yell couldn't think couldn't breathe he held billy by the shirt and dragged him in beneath the ledge that formed the edge of a of the stream bed away from the trees and out of the wind Lottie was there already, and they huddled under the overhang just as the clouds cracked again and hail, and hail the size of Francis' fists pounded down. One hailstone glanced off the side of his head and nearly knocked him out. Move in more, he yelled over the roar of the storm. Further back, move! He pushed against Billy, who slammed into Lottie, and they were already up against the, drop, the clay bank beneath the ledge and could not go farther in. Francis's legs and rear were still out in the hail and took a fearful beating. He doubled his legs up, but even so, the pain was excruciating and through the large hailstones quickly gave way. And though the large hailstones quickly gave way to smaller ones, his legs were immediately stiff and sore. The stream bed filled in the heavy downpour. Luckily, they were near the upstream portion of the st storm and so avoided the possibility of a flash flood, which would have gouged gouged them out of the overhang and taken them downstream to drown. As it was, the water came into the pocket beneath them and turned the dirt to mud, and soon they were sitting in a hole, a waist-deep hole of thick mud and water, and just as soon, in minutes, the rain had stopped. The clouds had scudded away, and the sun was out, cooking the dry mud. Aching, Francis pulled himself into the sun, the children crawled after water still ran in the stream but was receding quickly the hot sun felt good and francis wanted to take his buckskin shirt off to hang but he knew that if he didn't keep wearing it the shirt would dry as stiff as board he straightened slowly worked the pain out of his legs he looked to the waist west and smiled there would be no tracks after that there might not even be any com comancheros left if the lightning hit their horses which happened often Horses seemed to draw lightning. Buffalo, too. Francis had seen dead buffalo after a thunderstorm still smoking from lightning strikes. The meat already cooked and ready to eat. Thinking of roast buffalo made his stomach growl. 
I'm hungry. It was the first thing they'd heard in hours from Billy, finally awake, a standing mud ball. I'm really hungry. Well, I hope you weren't figuring on meat for a meal, Lottie said, holding up Francis's rifle, because this thing isn't going to shoot. Francis took the weapon and his possible's bag from her. Both were soaked as he, as he set to work. He opened the possible's bag and spread his patch material, mattress ticking, and two cans of hundred percussion caps each on a dry on a rock to dry in the sun. The caps had stayed mostly dry in the in the tight containers, but he knew they fired better when totally dry. He was surprised to find that the powder was only slightly damp. The powder horn was watertight except for the stopper on the pour spout on the pouring end, and it had let in only a drop or two, which had been quickly absorbed by the powder near the spout and hadn't penetrated into the rest of the powder. He thought of pouring the powder on a rock to dry just to make sure, to make certain, but decided against it. It was all the powder he had, maybe enough for 80 or 100 shots, and one puff of wind would take it all away. The balls themselves were of lead and not damaged. He had about 60 left. The ball mold was of brass and would, ha would not rust, though he dried it carefully and set it aside. He checked his grease pouch and found it still in good shape. The water couldn't do much to grease, and with his gear cleaned and drying, he went to work on the rifle. This rifle, a beautiful little Lancaster, had been given to him by his pa on his 14th birthday, the same day Francis had been kidnapped. Francis stared at the rifle. That birthday was so far away, a lifetime ago. He shook his head and went back to work. The rush of water had taken the percussion cap off the nipple, and he was certain water had worked through the nipple into the powder inside, this meant that the charge would be much reduced in power, if not completely ruined. He put a new cap on the nipple and went to the ledge where they had sheltered for the, from the hell and fired the rifle into the mud. Nothing happened the first time, nor the second. The third time, the, cap, the caps had burned enough water out so that the remaining powder charged, the remaining powder charge ignited with a dull thunk that drove the ball less than an inch into the mud of the bank. I'm getting hungrier, Billy said suddenly. Hush now, lizard gut. Lottie cuffed him <laughs> lightly across the back of the head. What are sisters good for? This is wonderful. He's working on his tools. Drink water to fill your belly and leave him alone. Francis sat on a rock, when, which was already dry from the heat of the noonday. Using only the small knife in the possible's bag, he took the knife, the rifle apart. The patch material was also dry, and he ran a slightly dampened patch down the bore of the barrel, then a dry one using the cleaning rag slot on the on his ramrod, and then it was completely dried out. And when it was completely dried out, he set it up so that the sun would shine right down the bore as directly as possible. The walnut stock was made well soaked, had been well soaked in oil and bear grease over the years, and the water had not penetrated the wood, but he removed the stock. He wiped it dry and then greased it with a touch of grease from his rat bag until it coked, it cooked, it cocked and snapped with an almost slick sound. Finally, he used a small nipple wrench from his possible's bag and removed the nipple, greased the threads, and screwed it back in place. Then he smeared a tiny amount of grease on a rag and pushed it through the bore over and over until the rifle was, comp was entirely greased and there wasn't a chance of rust. Finally, he put the weapon back together with practiced ease. He measured a charge, poured it down the bore, patched the ball with a grease patch, and pushed it down on the powder, pinched a cap so it would wedged tight on the nipple and put the hammer on half cock, the safety notch. There he stood. His shirt was dry and the mud had turned to dust and flaked off the soft leather. His buckskin pants were also dry and still soft and he put the strap of his possible's bag over his shoulder and looked at the sun. We've got a good five hours of daylight left, maybe six. This stream bed moves northeast or northwest, which is away from the Comancheros, and it's the way we want to go. So we'll follow it until dark. At least that way we'll have water and... I'm hungry, Billy had locked on the one thought. And my feet hurt. There's a chance we can run on some meat. All meat needs water. And they'll be coming to the stream bed to drink. And all our feet hurt because we're barefoot. Francis looked down at his feet. The moccasins had long since worn off from walking. They were good for only a few miles in sand and rock. Yes, his feet hurt too but they would soon toughen up and get calloused. He started off without speaking, and for once Lottie was silent. She followed, dragging Billy by the hand, and the three of them shuffled through the mud and sand and water of the quickly drying stream. 
wow, that was an interesting chapter. I was wondering if they had something to hold the water in. I would have thought they would have been looking for some water. But there you go. We'll be back next time with chapter three. See you then. Bye.